So welcome to the third and final session of our panel, Unsettling Climates, Exploring Climate Mobility with a Governance Perspective. And my name is Lily Lindegaard, and uh, I'm a researcher on the program Governing Climate Mobility, and we've convened this panel, and it's been a pleasure uh, the last couple days to see uh, so many exciting papers and so many exciting overlaps between them. Um, so today we have a few more and we are going to start with one of my colleagues, Desaline Ramacho uh, from Ethiopia and Desaline, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Lily. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, um, <clears throat> the subject of my paper is return migration. Uh, before I go into the subject, I just want to say one or two things by way of introduction. Um, um, we were not able to undertake uh, the kind of research that, would, that was necessary for this paper because of the pandemic. Uh, it's, it's ironic that uh, I'm, more, I'm, I'm, I'm writing a paper on something that's been affected by the pandemic, but I, I've been uh, detained, I mean, prevented by the pandemic from doing research on it. Um, mm. Now, um, in the last 10 years or so, uh, there has been um, uh, thousands of Ethiopians have been returned to the country from the Middle East. My focus, <coughs> my focus, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> the focus of my paper is migration and return migration from the Middle East in particular focusing on Saudi Arabia um, uh, for two reasons. One is, <clears throat> uh, one is the Saudi Arabia has hosted a huge number of Ethiopian migrants uh, going back for more than a decade. The estimate, there's no clear um, uh, figures, but the estimate is that it varies from one uh, agency to another. According to the International Organization of Migration, there were half a million Ethiopian migrants in Saudi Arabia. <clears throat> uh, but according to the Ethiopian government, that figure was 750,000. That's one reason. I mean, you know, in, in, with the exception of the United States, Saudi Arabia has hosted more Ethiopians than any, any other country in the world. Um, now, the second reason is that the number of returnees from migration, uh, Saudi Arabia again has had the largest number of returnees uh, usually uh, deported or uh, involuntarily um, repatriated to the country. So this is one of the main reasons why my focus is on Saudi Arabia. Now, <clears throat> um, the object, the main purpose of the study is to use return migration as a mirror to inquire, to examine what I call the migration, the broader migration project, particularly the migration project um, involving people from Northeast Ethiopia, which is predominantly Muslim, to the Middle Eastern countries, in particular, as I say, to Saudi Arabia. So return migration, I was hope, I hoped, would give us a, a good enough uh, understanding of this migration, labor migration, to the Middle East. Uh, now. Um, since, two, I, the, since 2013, migration to Saudi Arabia has been almost entirely irregular. Before 2013, the migration was through legal channels. People went there with the right papers, usually with a contract to work in some place. And so the, they, 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 they took off, I mean, they flew to the, to the uh, 
I don't know what the reason for that is. I think if you just continue with the kind of yes, the okay. Side um, of the I hope you can hear me. Uh, um, but uh, uh, to be uh, to 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 be as as brief as possible. Uh, th this agreement between Saudi Arabia and the Ethiopian government allowed to allow Ethiopian migrants to work in Saudi Arabia was abrogated in 2013 for a variety of reasons, which I don't have time to go into. Since 2013, therefore, migration, labor migration to Saudi Arabia has been through irregular channels, informal channels, or you know, uh, illegal channels. Now, irregular migration hides a number of things that are usually not uh, seriously considered. And that is, irregular migration really is a process of empowering somebody other than the migrants themselves. The key players here are people smugglers <clears throat> or people traffickers. So the agency that should have been the, 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 the migrants is now transferred, shifted to people smugglers. As you probably well know, uh, people smugglers very often are members of criminal gangs. Um, and so this point needs to be for, you know, established, needs to be the, uh, and Uh, going into the process of migration, which is my main subject, I'd like to say a few words uh, about what I call the migration narrative. Um, as you know, as we all know, uh, labor migrants are predominantly young people. And many of them are from either rural communities, semi-rural communities, or small towns, although there are also others from uh, from the, the larger cities. Um, in our case, the, uh, the ones we are interested in are um, semi-rural, uh, small town, uh, young people. Now, there is a, a set of claims and this migration narrative uh, that it's my own coinage, the migration narrative consists of a set of claims that is strongly held by the migrants, their families, as well as the community. Uh, and these claims are the following. Migration is the quickest way to escape poverty, to improve one's life, and that was one's, one's family and one's community. There is no future for young people in their home areas, in their, in their community, in their country. And they need, therefore, to go out somewhere in order to have a future. And that future, of course, is improved life, uh, prosperity, not just for themselves, but for their families and, by extension, for the, for the community. So there is this kind of uh, image of something outside of the country, a kind of an El Dorado, where if you go there and have the time, uh, spend a few years working, you return with um, enough resources to be able to live the good life, to be able to improve your family's life. So in other words, it, it sort of says, it is the exact opposite of, of, of what earlier generations were, 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 were uh, convinced of. Earlier generations, including my own generation, wanted to change the system by struggling within the country. This new generation of young people want to leave this, go out and come back with uh, fame and prosperity. Now, migration is also uh, downplays uh, the importance of education. So it has an influence on young people, on, on children. 
uh, there is a high dropout rate, uh, school dropout, dropout rate in our research community. Uh, by the time children get to be at the age of 14 or 15, they are groomed uh, or they are made to prepare for migration as their main uh, as their main goal in life. And so this dropout rate means they are out of the school system with basic just basic education, basic literacy. So this is then the migration narrative. And I'd like, you know, the, my attempt was to see whether or not, to what extent this has a bearing on the migration itself, the results, the process, etc. Now, the migration process begins from, of course, from the community, from the family. Uh, the family is the one that finances the migrant's journey to his or her destination. Uh, which means uh, most of the, the, the families in these rural communities that we're studying are poor. They do not, they cannot afford to pay the kind of money that people smugglers demand. And so they become indebted, they sell valuable assets and somehow or other raise the funds to pay for their children to go to this destination. So they're chosen destination. Um, now, the journey from the, the community to the, the destination is full of dangers and risks. I don't have time to go into the details, but I'll just mention a few of them. The risks involve you have to cross many countries before you reach Saudi Arabia. Uh, and at each point, the likelihood of being detained and thrown in jail, thrown into detention centers are very, is very high. The transit itself involves dangers. Crossing the Red Sea from, from Djibouti to Yemen often involves accidents, shipwrecks, uh, boats, these rickety boats that the people smugglers somehow uh, uh, get, get a hold of are, are mostly, most, most many times are not seaworthy. And there have been many incidents in which many lives have been lost. If you manage, if you are lucky enough not to lose your life at sea, you arrive in Yemen, and as you all know, Yemen is now in a bloody civil war. It is a failed state, but there are authorities somehow there, and you might end up being captured or caught by the authorities in Yemen, which means they then put you in detention uh, there are thousands of Ethiopians detained in Yemen. The IOM estimation in 2019 was that 3,000 Ethiopian migrants or would-be migrants were languishing in horrible conditions in Yemeni detention centers. If you are not, if you if you if you escaped being caught and thrown into detention, you could become stranded. The people smugglers get you to Yemen, and that is a claim their the responsibility. Other people smugglers then pick, take you from there to Saudi Arabia, but you have to pay. And very often, these youngsters do not have the money to pay these other smugglers, so they end up as, 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 as stranded people. Again, there are thousands of Ethiopians in Yemeni cities living you know, homeless, uh, without jobs, begging for their survival. If you are lucky enough not to be in this situation and proceed to uh, Saudi Arabia, you might be a victim of uh, uh, criminal gangs who may kidnap you for ransom. 
in all these detention areas, the conditions very are atrocious. And there are a large number of human rights abuses, et cetera, et cetera. I don't need to go into that. You then, if you are lucky, you arrive at the Saudi border and uh, the, the danger it, it, there too is being caught by the Saudi authorities and again thrown into detention or into prison. If you are lucky enough to not to be caught by the Saudi authorities, you enter Saudi Arabia. It does not mean the job is waiting for you and people are there welcoming you with a smile, et cetera, et cetera. No, you may be, uh, end up unemployed for a considerable number of, for a, a good number of, for, for quite some time. The IOM carried out a survey uh, in 2020 of returnees from Saudi Arabia, something 230,000 of them. And they found that 36% of those who are returned were unemployed in Saudi Arabia itself. If you do manage to be lucky enough to find a job, the job usually involves unskilled work with low pay and with very little benefits of any kind. Yeah, so that I'm sorry, as a Desaline, I'm very sorry to interrupt. Your time is almost finished, so if you could perhaps start. Okay, okay. so that's that's then the scenario. Um, what is the conclusion that I'm trying to derive? The conclusion is this, that returnees who returned from Saudi Arabia returned basically with nothing in their hands. They are penniless. Those who managed to send some remittances, those remittances were not enough for the family really to, to invest in long-term you know, uh, uh, investments. And they are spent for you know, food, basic necessities, et cetera, et cetera. So this idea that the migration will bring about this improvement in life, not only for yourself, for your family, also for the community. That migration is this thing about helping, in fact, in the, as a tool for the development process, is very difficult to, to jive with the scenario that just, I just tried to, to, uh, to present to you. They return without skills because the jobs they do do not provide them with skills. They return em empty, penniless, uh, and they return as in the same, they, they, they come back to the same conditions they were in before they left their communities. Jobless, without uh, any future, and so forth. So that is uh, that is uh, that is uh, the picture that comes out um, from my from my from my uh, from my research. So you know it means failure is the rule, and success is the exception. Uh, thank you. I must stop here. Thank you so much, Tessalan. I thought it was extremely interesting also reading the paper and what you bring up about this kind of mismatch between perceptions and aspirations. Um, are there any uh, brief clarifying questions at the moment? Okay, I don't hear anything. So we will proceed in just a moment to Marion. Boron, I hope I pronounced that correctly, but uh, perhaps you could also introduce yourself and I will share the screen for you. Okay, thanks a lot, Lily. Uh, thanks a lot to the first presenter. It was a very, very impressive uh, um, presentation. 
And uh, yeah, good afternoon, everyone. So I am Marion Borderon, and uh, I am a geographer at the University of Vienna in Austria. And one of the co-author of the paper I will, uh, I will be presented. And uh, I'm very pleased to have the opportunity to, to exchange with you about this work. So thank you very much, uh, Lily and Nile, to uh, have made this uh, possible. Um, next slide, please, Lily. Yeah, so for perhaps the short note on the research frame of this uh, research on uh, poverty, migration, and drought in uh, in uh, Kersa in Estarage. So Kersa, just perhaps to locate it, it is uh, a bit in between uh, Arar and, uh, and Diredawa, if it speaks to you. And uh, this is a collective endeavor with three other colleagues of mine, so Nega Asefa, Laurence Reboul, and Johan uh, Douagnon, and we are quite uh, interdisciplinary which has made this uh, work and makes the work quite fascinating. So Nega is professor of reproductive health and has been the director of uh, the health and demographic research system or center of KESA. Uh, Laurence is a mathematician at ex marseille University and Johan is a demographer, geographer at the Catholic University of Louvain in Belgium. Uh, so what has put uh, us all together here it's the desire to find, uh, explore relevant macro data from secondary sources to study phenomena like migration at a local scale, but in a quantitative manner, or then using a, a mixed, uh, mixed method approach. Uh, so we often hear, I think, uh, that um, now we have entered an era where data scarcity is not the main issue anymore. And uh, so we have decided to go fishing for existing data. But as you know, it's still not perfect. But inst interestingly, uh, some types of data, like for instance, from this health demographic surveillance system, uh, I've been collecting yeah, data also on migration routinely. And it's not the case here in the center, but in some other part of the, of the world, uh, like for example, in Bangladesh, it's even has been the, so the, yeah, the, some centers have been um, in place uh, yeah, for, for 60 years now. Um, so this migration component, I've been a little bit overlooked so far in this uh, center, uh, in this surveillance system. So we thought uh, that could be uh, great to see how uh, possible it is to understand migration and the nexus between migration and environmental change in some of the most vulnerable livelihood system, because this surveillance system uh, are placed in the most deprived area of the world. Um, next slide, please. So if we wish to position ourselves in the panel so far, I would say that uh, our contribution is definitely an empirical one. And uh, we wish to explore, so we have talked a bit about this capacity, uh, here you see the question capacity to adapt. Um, so that uh, we wish to understand this relationship between capacities or capabilities, if you uh, think of the, the terms coined by um, Amatya Sen, and uh, the relationship here yeah, of this term with migration behavior. And uh, some aspect I have crossed in this work uh, resonates a lot with what has been said uh, just, just before. Um, and here also, because what I will present uh, is, um, um, yeah, um, is extract from this data and uh, apply a quantitative uh, form. So that's, uh, I really like one of the comments um, which has been made during our last, uh, just the last session before. So this quantitative approach would allow us to describe some parts of the relationship between capabilities and migration, uh, but it would open the door for assumptions, but it will let the possibility document this, why it is like this uh, by additional fieldwork. So in a way, we can also take this presentation as the beginning of a, of a bigger adventure. Okay, so anyway, to, uh, to do so, to try to perhaps next, Slide, please. Thank you. To, um, to understand this relationship between um, yeah, capabilities, so poverty, migration, and environmental change, we will uh, use and follow the theoretical framework uh, developed by, uh, yeah, I would say, Carling and uh, uh, Heinz and, and some others. So, this aspirations capabilities framework. And um, yeah, even so, we will focus mainly on this capability uh, axis. We have few aspects on the perception of living conditions. So I, uh, in the data we have, we don't really cover directly aspiration, but we will still have some um, aspect of uh, how, how the individuals perceive the, uh, um, so the living conditions. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, or perhaps just, sorry. Uh, if we stay here, yeah, I mean, but it's, uh, it might be, um, 
a bit obvious, but what interests uh, me, if, if you have looked a bit at the paper, is to understand if and when low capabilities uh, would lead to immobility, which I mean, at least a non-voluntary um, immobility, and could thus become a real issue in a context where resources and livelihoods have been eroded by uh, climatic change. Next slide, please. So, um, yeah, in 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 a nutshell, our research question is yeah, it's quite simple as you see, and uh, we'll follow this importance of contextual knowledge. So, as we know from the literature, migration migration is a normal aspect of life. It's multicausal. It's complex, and without unraveling the context of migration, it will it will be hard to be conclusive. So, we need these contextu uh, contextual elements to understand the nexus between. Um, uh, here drawed poverty um, and, uh, and migration. Next slide, please. And then to reply to our question, I was talking about a more quantitative approach. And here, so we will use the data collected in the frame of this HDSS, so Health Demographic Surveillance System. Uh, and then we focus on 12 Kibeles, which is so 12 districts uh, of the Kassa region, which have uh, been monitored since, since 2007. So we have a panel data um, covering uh, about uh, yeah, more or less 10 years. Uh, so that you see on the slide, um, it would, would yeah, I mean about uh, 77,000 individuals of uh, 50,000 um, households, sorry. Oh yeah, sorry, um, of to, to, um, 13,000 uh, households and almost 50,000 individuals of uh, age superior or equal at 13 years old. Um, yeah, next slide, please. So this just 13 uh, years old is a threshold we have decided when we have looked at the distribution of the first migration, we see that um, yeah, the, 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 the frequency uh, start to be high from 13 years old. So we decided to look at the behavior of the first migration from this age. Um, method wise, we are very in a way faithful to this graphene a part of our discipline, so demography or geography. So we have adopted a um, very descriptive and exploratory approach uh, and look in, first to look in detail at the data, a bit at the three scale. So at this uh, Kebele level, at this individual and household level. And that will allow us uh, in the final part to apply the multi-level uh, multi discrete time survival analysis to understand everything in there. So I don't want to spoil uh, the presentation, but unfortunately I won't present the, the final model here uh, because we are that the pro and cons of working with mathematicians is there a little bit um, sometime. Um, so that we, we are like uh, just uh, making sure that all um, Everything is very, uh, very well done, and uh, we have to uh, to impute some some just missing data from when viable, so uh, that it was not finished on time. Um, but we still have some results that I would uh, happily share with you. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, yeah, so I present the key message first because I also have been a bit greedy in my number of slides, and I just want to be sure that uh, you see uh, this preliminary result. So I would say um, that what we have um, um, observed is that the migration rate is surprisingly low. And I think if we uh, take some aspect that was just mentioned um, by Ramato saying that this narrative of uh, the Prof Arya that decided that migration is the quickest way to get out of poverty. Uh, here it is very, uh, we were surprised to not see uh, many um, uh, young people, or at least around uh, 20 years old, investing in migration. But in a way, to be frank with you, the first time that we have had some descriptive results, I thought, but what's a low or high out migration rate? Um, what should have, uh, what could we have expected? And I think here, due to the positive of migration data, sometimes it's, we have limited comparison point. So when we say that we have recording, uh, recorded an out migration rate of few percent, what does it mean really? And it's a little bit difficult to answer this. Um, of course, there are very key uh, and brilliant former publications on the topic, but figures remain a little bit scarce. So in a way, we having uh, saying, okay, we have a, a rich uh, database, uh, and then we can uh, we can get a very precise ad migration rate. Uh, sometime uh, also we also face the the issue of uh, of the meaning of these figures. 
Um, but the good thing is, um, we looking at greater details, we can really uh, uh, combine uh, so yeah our data and understand this out migration rate per destination, per per gender, per uh, um, educational level, and so on. So we have uh, been able to. Uh, to, to slightly understand better our uh, study area and understand better what, what seems to be happening. Um, so here, for example, we see that the populations living in the lowland and the highland of Kersa, compared, for example, to the, to the midland, uh, are characterized by very low capabilities and are the least prone to migrate. So we would see quickly in detail some aspect. Um, the more immobile population is the less literate, uh, live more in generally degraded conditions and so on, which is probably not so surprising. So what we want to say here, it's the norm is the uh, immobility and limited capabilities. So therefore, uh, it is also good to underline again that new strategies to adapt to environmental change will be uh, more than crucial in, uh, in the future. Next slide, please. So perhaps if we look a little bit in details, I didn't check mm -hmm. the time. Could you just tell me how, how long, Lily, I have? Yes, you're almost there. So if you could. Okay, so perhaps that. I can uh, pick up uh, one or two slides of interest. Just uh, so here it's, um, yeah, yeah, perhaps next, next slide. So there, there are some aspects that are described. Um, so here we see women uh, migrate. Uh, in general, uh, women migrated more uh, in this place, uh, in this many for marriage reason, reason, uh, reason. What we can see here is you really have this kind of staircase shape that, uh, in any case, migrants would be more uh, literate than uh, non migrant. For example, for the male, is 75% uh, of the male who have migrated are literate, con uh, contrary to 50% uh, of the, the, the women who, who have stayed during the, the, the 10 year period. Uh, next slide, please. Um, then this, this graph um, is, for example, and typically covered one of the aspects you have written in your report, uh, 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 Nail and uh, others, uh, that if we look, I want to look in details about the relationship, the direct relationship between our migration rate and, for example, precipitations like the, 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 the risk of drought. Um, it's pretty challenging to find the patterns. Uh, and then we could make some assumptions. We see, for example, that since 2015, in 2015, there was this, um, this big uh, drought, uh, one of the biggest for, for the decade. And we observe uh, that despite the fact that the ultimate question rate was a bit um, higher before, it's completely dropped. Next slide, please. And if we look at in details according to the different type of uh, reason for migration, like job seeking of marriage migration, we see different patterns. But we see that some as this part that it's more that in 2014, there is a bit of an exception. And then the two years after it drops. Next slide, please. Um, next slide. So this is just to tell, but I don't want to spend so much time. Um, that finally, when we look at things at a very coarse uh, special resolution, um, in a way, sometimes it's easier because we, you see uh, more uh, relationship. The more details you have, and sometimes uh, the least connection is, is easy to observe. Next slide, please. Next slide. And next slide. And I will finish uh, on this aspect then. So what's at the household level, we use the, the richness of our data to create um, a cluster uh, analysis where we were uh, capable of organizing, so of uh, grouping our households, so our uh, 13,000 households uh, in different groups uh, corresponding to these uh, capacities and satisfaction. So we had um, um, three variables describing the passive satisfaction of living conditions. We had um, several variables describing literacy and 17 variables describing assets and housing characteristics and condition. And what is really fascinating, next, next slide, um, please. That is, and I will stop on that. It's that we find a geographical patterns of the dimensions of capabilities and satisfaction. So the scores are all significantly different. And for example, what we could uh, keep in mind, and it's like, for example, if you look at the Midland with irrigation, the so categories you have in a, a bit of a, the green, uh, you see that, for example, satisfaction is higher, uh, despite the fact that the capacity is not particularly high. Capacity, capabilities are just high in urban places. And final slide, please. And then when you look at the migration rate, 
migration rate is, is slightly higher and significantly higher in, uh, in the urban places where uh, we have already observed more, so higher capabilities. And uh, yeah, the lowest in, um, in the, the category uh, of the, so many, it was many lowlands in these categories where people are not so satisfied about the living conditions. Uh, but we could ask, make the assumption that this, uh, due to limited capabilities, they uh, were not uh, capable of investing in migration. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. That was really interesting. And it's been, I mean, really just fascinating seeing all of these things kind of coming together and, and so the way that you're bringing in capabilities and also aspirations and the different factors that you guys are seeing coming out in the data. So thank you very much for that. Is there anyone that has any clarifying questions? I see, um, let me see, Neil has a question. Let me just see if it's clarifying. Um, okay, so there is in your framework. Neil is asking in the capability aspiration frame, framework, does governance have a role? So in our paper that we presented earlier in the panel, we use capacity to aspire to indicate aspirations changing. And that could be changes rooted in age, gender, economic condition, health, et cetera. Here, government, political authorities um, play many roles, perhaps. What's your view? Yeah, I guess it's here where so far, and that's uh, where we have been trying to, 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 to go there for, for, for more than a year now. So it's we have limited information about, um, so more, um, yeah, like, so on the, the, the governance. What I hope is the fact, and that's why I mentioned this irrigation part, is like in this uh, classification of cables that we have, it's so they are uh, these 12 cables, they all belong to a very specific type that could be characterized by the elevation, but also by different um, uh, system in place. Um, and like, for example, in the Midlands, uh, there is really a clear cut between the Midlands where uh, uh, there is in place uh, irrigation system mm -hmm. uh, and some places not and uh, some some infrastructures for example access to uh, to um, to uh, to pave road and and so on so i hope to 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 give uh, more uh, description at this level and then uh, also uh, yeah being being uh, able to to incorporate and to insert some of this aspect at this level Thank you very much. All right, um, we will now move on to another of my colleagues, Zerhun Mohammed. Zerhun, the floor is yours. Thank you, Lily. Uh, let me try to share uh, my slide. Uh, Okay, uh, thank you Lily again. Uh, my name is Zarihun, Zarihun Mohammed. Uh, I'm involved in uh, uh, governing climate uh, mobility uh, projects uh, with my colleague. And uh, this is uh, a very small paper, uh, me and uh, my colleague, um, Adana Alemayo, uh, try to write. Uh, it's try to look at industrial parks and labor migration along ethnic uh, regional boundaries uh, by taking the case of Hawasa Industrial Park located in uh, South Central Ethiopia. Uh, as you know, uh, migration or uh, mobility, whatever we call it, and different forms has become uh, one of climate uh, <coughs> induced uh, socioeconomic challenges. Uh, just like in other parts of uh, the country, uh, unemployment, uh, both in rural and urban areas, and migration very high in Shashamani. Shashamani is uh, located uh, 250 kilometers uh, south of uh, Addis Ababa. And this paper particularly examines uh, the immobility or immobility of uh, wage laborers from uh, Shashamani and the surrounding districts, uh, which are located in Western RC zone of Romia region to Hawassa Industrial Park and Hawassa by crossing regional and linguistic uh, cultural boundaries. So the objective of the paper is uh, to analyze cultural, political, and governance factors 
that affects the nature, magnitude, and attitude of uh, mobility or immobility of potential uh, job seekers from uh, Oromia regional states to Hawassa and Hawassa industrial parks. Just to give a, a brief description of uh, the two areas, Hawassa is just 275 kilometers uh, south of Addis Ababa. It's a capital city of both uh, two regional cities recently. Previously, it was uh, under Southern Nation Nationality and People's Regional States. And now it's also the capital city of Sidama Regional State, which established in uh, 2019. Uh, in Awasa and surrounding area, the Sidama ethnic group are the dominants, but still the town is a um, multi-ethnic city, partly due to the mobility, labor mobility that happened in the past uh, almost 50 years. So currently, uh, Awasa is serving the capital city of uh, Southern Nation Nationalists and People, regional states, and at the same time, at the Sidama regional states. Shashevani is also uh, located in, uh, in Oromia region, and it's just uh, located 22 kilometers uh, north of Hawassa, and uh, it's dominated by the uh, RC Oromo. Uh, this map shows Shashevani is a business center that connects uh, something like five regional states, uh, while uh, Awasa is an industrial city, uh, the south of uh, Shashamani. So mobility to Awasa uh, is not a new phenomenon. Uh, Awasa, uh, on the other hand, is a fast growing uh, political industrial city in southern Ethiopia. Uh, it's established uh, in 1960, that means it's a relatively young city by the standard of other Ethiopian cities. The foundation of Awasa is related to uh, factors that happen at macro and local levels. At macro level, uh, the government, the imperial government had a vision towards socio-economic development uh, based on promoting commercial agriculture, agro-industry settlements and others. At a macro level, uh, Awasa and surrounding areas had abundant rich natural resources, arable land that were accessible in different forms. And also there was a booming uh, market in late 1960s and early 1970s for agricultural products and also the natural beauty of the lake area and favorable uh, climatic condition. So based on these factors, um, the government designed uh, uh, a big project that had three interrelated uh, projects, uh, components. The first one is to establish uh, a modern tower with uh, pre-planned uh, facilities. Uh, then Awasa, which was a small settlement area, became uh, one of the towers in Ethiopia uh, established with pre-planned designs. The second one uh, component of the project was a community center and settlements. And the community center uh, later became uh, the foundation for Awas Agricultural uh, College, which become uh, now Awasa University. And settlement-wise, the government brought uh, some people from neighboring districts, composed of uh, some like uh, nine ethnic groups and settled in a place called Shamanna. And the final component was the establishment of government in private owned commercial farms and agro-industries in Awasa and uh, surrounding areas. Lands were granted to different group of people to promote uh, commercial farming with a number of uh, benefits, uh, including tax exemptions. And also the government um, established uh, uh, farmers in and around Awasa by the support from uh, foreign aids, including the former Yugoslavian uh, government. There are also uh, some agro industries in Awasa and around. The notable ones are the tobacco uh, and sisal plantations just outside uh, uh, Awasa. So all these factors in the 90s uh, uh, attracted a large number of people uh, to Awasa to work as uh, wage laborers. The majority of these people were uh, those coming from neighboring areas of Tambata, Hadia, and Walaita. And those people uh, came from areas where there was a high uh, population density and 
and also population pressures. And also there was a high level of scarcity of land that was aggravated by the then forms of land ownership and access. So those land hungry peoples were looking for uh, other livelihood opportunities and the opening of uh, these commercial farms and uh, agro industries were really very good uh, opportunities that are taken by the people who are living uh, uh, some kilometers uh, far from Awaza. The local people, both the Sidama and the RC, were reluctant uh, to join this army of uh, wage laborers for two major reasons. The first one was uh, the livelihoods, and the Sidama were agriculturalists and agropastoralists, and they were not as such interested in, in uh, wage labor. <clears throat> Although land scarcity was apparent in Sidama areas, it was not too severe uh, to push young Sidamas to join this uh, army of wage laborers. The same was true for the uh, pastoralist and agro-pastoralist RC, uh, who were uh, more interested in cattle uh, than, than uh, being uh, wage laborers. In fact, there was also cultural reasons for these two groups not to join uh, this uh, wage uh, uh, labor and uh, culturally in both areas, wage labor was looked down on. And even uh, derogatorily, these people who were working there were uh, called coolies. So uh, the, most of the migrants were coming from Kambata, Hadiya, and Walaita uh, re uh, regions. Well, the 1974 revolution uh, that brought the 1975 land uh, reform and all rural lands were confiscated. And uh, accordingly, those uh, uh, government owned and private uh, commercial farmers were nationalized. And those people who were working there as agricultural laborers became uh, the government's employed agricultural workers in those farms who were turned into a state farm. On the other hand, uh, no fundamental changes uh, uh, were uh, during the socialist dirty period in Awasa. Of course, there was some attempts by the Dirk government uh, to uh, push Awasa as industrial city by establishing a few uh, industries in the uh, city. The Awasa textile industry and the Awasa flow of uh, industries are two notable uh, industries in Awasa uh, during the dark period. But uh, in terms of mobility of uh, uh, people from Shashaman and around, there was no fundamental uh, uh, changes uh, because of the socialist, highly centralized recruitment system of uh, the dark period. All those uh, job seekers were registered at center and uh, they were given uh, the opportunities according to uh, uh, where the job is available, irrespective of uh, their origin, where they are living, or their ethnic identities. So uh, in general, uh, there was a little mobility or no mobility from Shashamani to the neighboring uh, uh, Awasa during the dark period. The 1991 uh, 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 change of political system uh, brought uh, some fundamental changes on this regard. Uh, as we know, the uh, fall of the Dirk and uh, coming of EPRDF was marked by the coming of ethnic based uh, political system in Ethiopia. That's in fact crystallized the cultural boundary between the Sidama and the RC who are sharing a long boundary uh, along the former Sidama and uh, Shawa region. On the economic areas, there are there were two major uh, changes. On the economic area, the dark strict socialist uh, political uh, no economic policies were changed, and a new market oriented uh, economic policy were introduced that paved the way for more wage labor uh, opportunities in uh, Awasa. The other changes that came in the post-1991 period and the population uh, pressure and climate change in both Sidama and RC areas. Uh, due to high population increase in RC dominated areas of Shashamani, there was land scarcity become very apparent and to the extent of uh, uh, having no land uh, 
to provide to young uh, land claimants. As a result, people are forced uh, to look different opportunities and migration become uh, one of viable uh, livelihood uh, option in, in Shashamani and around. This in the form of rural urban migration or uh, migration to other areas, including the Rift Valley uh, farmers, like flower farmers and horticulture farmers are located uh, somewhere like 100 uh, kilometers far from the area. International migration has also become uh, another option for um, jobless uh, people in Shashamane. The Gulf and uh, South Africa became uh, the two major destination for the uh, my young migrants from the area. In the meantime, there is increasing demand for wage or casual la labor opportunities in Shashamane and in Awasa too. And there is change in attitude towards this uh, wage labor in those areas. But still, we don't see many people migrating to Awasa in search of job from Shashabane, Siraro, and other RC dominated uh, areas. While this is the case, uh, uh, we need to look at the industrial parks in general and uh, Awasa industrial parks, so why they are uh, created and how this affected the job. Uh, opportunities in Shashamane and around. Industrial parks uh, in general, sorry. Parts of the country's aspiration uh, to attain st uh, structural transformation from an agrarian economy to one of industrialized countries. And in fact, it was intended uh, to boost um, the industrial sectors. So in general, industrial parks are intended to serve four interrelated objectives. The first one is to increase the capacity of the, the manufacturing sector, increase its share in the national economy, and even the government was uh, aspiring to be one of the leading uh, manufacturing countries uh, in the region. The second one is by creating favorable conditions to uh, domestic and mainly to foreign um, investors, attract foreign direct investments, and the third one is facilitate technology transfers to the country. And uh, uh, finally, and the major one is creating job opportunities to the people uh, in, in, in the country. With these objectives, uh, a total of 30 industrial parks specializing in different sectors, and some of them are uh, uh, <clears throat> general, and some other are uh, spe specializing in some sectors are established in different parts of the countries. Awasa Industrial Park is one of the 13 industrial parks uh, specializing on apparel and textile uh, industries. It's uh, established in 2016. And in fact, Awasa Industrial Park is established to be um, a flagship of industrial parks in Ethiopia uh, with its uh, environmental friendly uh, technologies, capacities, and all other uh, uh, facilities. Yeah, it has, you're getting, sorry to interrupt. You're getting towards the end of your time. So if you could begin. Okay, to. I'm trying to push. Uh, so uh, it's providing, intended to provide uh, 600,000 600, job opportunities, mainly to uh, women. Employment uh, wise, it's intended to provide job opportunities for people who come around 100 kilometer radius. And there are uh, some agencies that were responsible for recruiting uh, people. So how they were recruiting people in two forms. The first one is in catchment areas. And certain catchment areas uh, were established in Southern Nation Nationalities People uh, region. That's uh, near to the town of Awasa, to some 250 kilometers south of uh, the town. The second one is in walking, people walking. Uh, straight to the park and uh, ask for job opportunities. When you look at the people coming to the uh, Wasa Park, this uh, table shows that uh, in, uh, since October uh, to June, uh, something like 216 uh, women joined the uh, job market and 72.8% of them uh, are from Sidama. And the share of Oromia who are living just 20 kilometers far from the park is only uh, 2%. Uh, so we ask why people uh, from Shashaman and neighboring districts uh, due to climate change and other challenges do not migrate or move to Awasa Industrial Park in search of job. 
So we found out two major factors. The first one is cultural factors. There is a strong cultural linguistic barriers between the Sidama and the RC Oromos. There was age old conflicting relationship between the two groups that discourage mobility to the territory of what call it so-called others groups. So the new ethnic based political system also glorified uh, the ethnic cultural boundaries between the groups and discouraged uh, migration. Second one is system of labor recruitment or the management. So all catchment areas are located in, in the southern region and no catchment area in Oromia. And even the agreement that was signed between uh, the regional industry and trade and the, uh, the, the uh, industry park uh, development agency was with southern region and there was no any agreement with Oromia region. So there is at local level a tendency of considering the job opportunities as privileges of the people of the region. The attempt of Sashimane to uh, city to send something like 100 girls to the neighboring uh, industrial park uh, was not successful so far. So to conclude, Hawasa was not new to uh, receiving labor migrants for a long period of time, but the local people were not interested for a long period of time. The linguistic cultural barriers discouraged the people from migrating from Oromia to those areas. Now, the new, when there's a need to migrate, this the new political system and regional uh, federal uh, attitude and the local perception of job opportunities discouraged the migration of RC Oromo to uh, nearby industrial park and the benefit to that. What's really interesting is Awasa Industry Park now is located in Sidama area. Will it change with the change of the political structure? And just like Oromia region, will they push those coming from the Southern Nation, Nationalist and People's region to be what we'll see in the future? Sorry for taking more time and thank you, Dili. Okay, sorry, the unmuting. We're still getting uh, <laughs> getting used to that after so long. Okay, but thank okay. you so much, Serhun. And it was just wonderful. And I really enjoyed reading the paper as well. And just putting all of these kinds of shifts and transformations together with mobility, with environmental change, with socio and economic and political transformations over time. It was really fascinating. So I can see that there are a lot of questions coming up, which is wonderful. Before we get to the questions, we actually have um, the wonderful opportunity of having a discussant to kind of pull out some um, overarching kind of themes coming out of the paper. Uh, paper. So today we have uh, another colleague, Joseph Tay, that will uh, have about five minutes now to, uh, to bring out some things from the different papers. Thank you very much. Uh, all the presenters for very interesting papers that which you have uh, presented uh, this afternoon. Uh, I really enjoy listening to all of them. I've seen that the papers, even though the titles look different, there are common themes that you have all looked at, which are very interesting. One of them has to do with how current migration patterns are rooted in historical antecedents. So, even the paper on the parks, the paper on the irregular migration, and the paper on migration and poverty, looking at the capacities, all of them have talked about some historical issues which are very important. We do know that climate change interacts with poverty and also some political factors in all the papers to shape the migration patterns that have been looked at. Uh, we have also seen that internal migration is the most dominant, but then the destination are diversified. So we've seen increasing movement towards the Gulf states, for instance, uh, which is something that has been observed in other parts of Africa, and that is very interesting. And then we've also seen the role of uh, local institutions and governor factors in shaping migration, and then also uh, return migration management, something that I would want to hear. Now turning to the individual papers, I have a few questions that maybe I want to ask. So if we look at the very interesting paper by the Salin, uh, despite the, the fact that the title suggests that it's uh, on return migration, he's done a very excellent job 
by looking at even the political and economic drivers of migration uh, before turning down to look at the return migration. That is very important. But what I have to ask here is why is it that despite the failure of many return migrants, more and more people still want to migrate, more and more people are still migrating. So that is one question that I want to ask. Then also, how is the government dealing with the trafficking and the smuggling? We do know that at the EU level, uh, we have engaged uh, the Gulf state countries to try to end the kafara systems. And we know that some countries, including Ethiopia, sometimes have tried to ban migration to some of those places that we know that it is difficult to implement it. So apart from that, are there policy engagement poly uh, activities in the communities? More importantly, because there's a you have shown that families are important when it comes to the decision making. So are they being engaged for instance? So those are my questions for you. Marion also presented very interestingly. I really enjoyed that topic. In fact, the area of immobility is a neglected area in migration and climate change research. All the time, the focus is on those who move, not those that are left uh, behind. And she has done very well to look at how capability can determine ability or inability to move. And so that is very interesting. I've noted that this presentation focused more on economic factors and poverty, but just for curiosity, uh, have you maybe through your literature search or maybe through what you know about the area, uh, did you look at the role of governance in shaping capability, in shaping mobility and immobility? And then also, did you come across any issue of cultural factors causing involuntary or voluntary immobility? Uh, this is something that is in the literature. Some were maybe facing climatic stress, but they may decide not to move if they feel they are strongly attached to the land, in which case we can say the cultural factors are leading to voluntary immobility. In West Africa, sometimes people think their ancestors have been buried in some communities where they stay, and that is where they derive their presence, so they don't want to move. I just want to hear if there are things of that nature in Ethiopia where cultural factors have shaped immobility, either voluntary or involuntary. Then lastly, your paper, which is also very interesting on the industrial parks, again, highlight the long history of migration, which is caused also by unbalanced development. Uh, again, you have talked about the cultural dimensions of uh, migration, which is very fascinating. What I want to hear, maybe your thoughts on, will be whether there are gender dynamics of the migration for work in these industrial parks, and then also in the literature, we come across the issues of exploitation and wage discrimination, uh, especially between the expatriates and local people in industrial park areas. I just want to hear your view of the situation on this within the Ethiopia context. So thanks again, I will end here since there are other questions that many people will ask. Thank you for your anxiety presentations. Thank you so much, Joseph. It was, uh, it was also really good to get some good questions to start us off there. And what I would like to do is to take a quick first round where we address some of the um, questions that Joseph has brought up. And also if you want to speak to some of the things coming out from the other papers, um, since there are some really interesting dynamics there. Uh, so two minutes for all of you. Um, Desaline, I know you have a power issue on your computer. So if you could perhaps start. Desaline, you're muted. Okay. Um, yes, um, I think the, the reason there are more and more migrants, despite the failures, um, is this powerful um, uh, hold on people of what I call the, the narrative, the migration narrative. Uh, that's one, one reason. Um, uh, is the government doing something about the people smugglers, people traffickers? Uh, yes, but not, I mean, I haven't seen much in terms of uh, 
actually arresting them, taking you know, taking them to court, putting them in prison, and so forth. But there are laws. In fact, the recent law on on people trafficking is a very very strong and harsh law. Uh, and 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 so the the instruments are there, but um, there's been uh, problems having to do with uh, implementing those instruments. Um, now, one or two questions were raised by others through um, through the chat. Can I can I address uh, them, or do I need to wait for 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 another turn? Well, you know what? Since especially since we're not sure how your battery is going to last, please go ahead. <laughs> yes, uh, one of the questions was: Does the government prosecute? I think that's Francis prosecute those who return? No, 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 no. Actually, this one of the the agencies that brings these people from from Saudi Arabia back to the country is the government itself. Uh, the government has invested a lot of money bringing uh, migrants, uh, return migrants back to the country. Uh, it has been helped, of course, supported by international organizations uh, like IOM, ILO, and so forth. Um, but uh, yeah. Um, and if they are provided with with a temporary shelter, I mean, of course, nowadays because of the COVID pandemic, they have to spend their days in quarantine, and then then they leave and have to go back to their homes once they are proven to be free of the pandemic. Um, somebody asked uh, uh, how widespread is uh, the migration uh, and, uh, the narrative. It's quite wide, widespread. I mean, we, we came across it when we went first for the first round of field work, as well as for the second round of field work. We did do a small, a very small, I don't, I'm not very proud of it uh, because it's too small uh, sample. Uh, small number of interviews with returnees, and uh, that is that, that is this narrative in one form or other came up uh, through the discussions we had with them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jessalyn. Um, Marion, if you could perhaps take a couple of minutes. Yes, uh, so thank you very much for um, yeah for for this uh, question and all uh, comment. Um, I do admit uh, and that I uh, basically reply uh, not to, so directly last time to the question from Nail, and uh, that will also be linked to uh, to the comment from uh, Joseph. Um, I think one of the, the limitation of this uh, aspiration capability framework, which will to overlook a little bit the, the, the um, at least meso levels, what's going on and the governance part, and that it uh, emphasizes a lot on the individual agency or household agency. Um, so that's also something we have basically uh, a little bit transferred. Uh, so we uh, uh, have done also a little bit in this um, expression of data, which is, uh, as I said, so we look a lot more on uh, some individual characteristics and household characteristics. And then uh, also as a geographer was really uh, interesting in looking at the geographical patterns of some 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 pa um, dimensions and then also because we have these cables and that some are very different um, as i said so between the, the lowland and the highland but also the, the type of uh, of crops and uh, activities we have two also two cables uh, that's covered uh, like so kesa and wetter uh, which are two uh, small cities. And then we have uh, seen that uh, the out migration patterns is, is really different uh, as well as uh, the, 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 what we have uh, documented as the capabilities and uh, the aspirations. Um, we also have greater details that I had uh, yeah, not presented here about uh, land fragmentation, about uh, resettlement. So we have a little bit few aspects which goes beyond the uh, individual and household perspective. Uh, also one of the migration reasons is search for land. And perhaps the frustration here, uh, at least at the quantitative level, but I hope to uh, overcome this 
uh, with uh, more uh, field work with focus group discussion and interviews uh, if um, when when we are uh, able to do that is to we, we see that this 2015 has been one of uh, a, a very important drought uh, there and um, and we see like for example people stop to search for land for this year and the the, the, the next two years after um, so there are some aspects, but then it is it becomes uh, completely qualitative in a way because we don't have uh, ten years. Is, it is interesting; it's panel data, but it's not over sixty years. And as I think Joseph presented very well this morning, when you want to understand trends in uh, climatic data, you will go for twenty, thirty uh, years of aggregation. Um, so then the thing is, we would need a couple of droughts to really understand if uh, the reaction we observe in our data are the fact that people have reacted in 2015 to uh, environmental, uh, so this um, um, phenomenon, so like this drought, or there was also some political um, issues at this time. So um, yeah, we could make assumptions, but so that would be uh, completely fascinating to collect uh, direct, more perceived information on the field. Uh, about this, and then of, of course to also document a bit better if they are, uh, yeah, what would be the role of uh, of governance uh, in our case. Yeah, thanks a lot. Thank you, Mayan. Bergman, would you like to come in now? Uh, thank you, uh, Lily. Um, uh, two issues uh, really they are very interesting, uh, as Joseph mentioned, and the gender dimension of labor migration uh, in the industrial parks. In fact, industrial parks, particularly those focusing on specialized on textile and apron, are uh, largely targeting uh, women uh, workers. In fact, in our industrial park, uh, the uh, agency that was recruiting uh, uh, workers, semi-skilled and unskilled workers was targeting to bring 85% of uh, the workers to be uh, women. So in that case, there is increasing trend of uh, bringing uh, women workers to the park. So uh, if you look at the majority of the 27,000 uh, workers now working in the Awas uh, Industrial Park uh, are women. In fact, this created a new discourse in uh, women migration in the area. Some of them are coming uh, in very far distance. They are living alone in uh, Awas or in a group and they are exposed to different type, kind of social problems. Uh, and because of that, the attrition rates uh, of women is higher than the, the uh, male workers. Uh, even when we look at the one I was mentioning, the Shashamani uh, city administration tried to send <clears throat> 1,000 workers to Awasa Industrial Park. These 1,000 uh, uh, job seekers, all of them are uh, women from Shoshamani who completed grade nine. So uh, yes, that's, that's a very interesting area to pursue and looking at. The second issue is the exploitation in the industrial park. Well, that's a highly documented area, exploitation in working condition in industrial parks. It was a big news uh, in some of international media some years ago. And still uh, there is uh, a serious acquisition of labor exploitation, not only in our industrial parks, in all other uh, industrial parks and private sector in general in the country. And uh, on the other hand, the government tried to attract foreign uh, direct investment by claiming there is cheap labor uh, in this country. Uh, so what do you expect when you, your own government is advertising for cheap labor? The one coming to the country uh, will notice that uh, not to meet the minimum. And also we don't have any minimum wage, uh, which will be uh, 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 put in place uh, as we are informed in our industrial park recently. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, the industrial, uh, in the industrial park, they question the productivity uh, and the work culture of the workers uh, uh, in Ethiopia. So they say that the payment they are paying uh, right now is compared to the productivity of the workers. It's uh, more or less the same. So it's, uh, there is a big debate which can't be really uh, pursued. Uh, that's, that's what I can say. Thank you, Lily. Thank you, all of you. So that was a great first round. And I wanted to follow up. Nina has a question also earlier in the chat. And I think I'll throw in one myself. But Nina asks, 
Thank you, Desaline, for your interesting presentation. In her research, she's found that some stranded or even successful migrants, mostly men, but also women, take part in the smuggling business. Do you have any indications that this is the case in your case? And if so, would this alter your conclusion? And then if I could throw in a question on top of that, one of the things I thought was really interesting coming out across the paper and kind of going back to um, the, the issue of governance and, um, and environmental changes and also rural livelihoods. I mean, this question of land and land access and land control land fragmentation, land pressure and so on. I mean, this is coming out in, in different ways throughout the papers. So I thought I might ask all of you to speak just a little bit to that as well. So Jessaline, if you could start. Desilane, you're muted, yes. Um, could you, uh, I, I couldn't, I didn't catch the, the questions. Could you just uh, repeat them uh, briefly, uh, mm -hmm. uh, Nina's and yours? Uh, yes. Because mm -hmm. I have a problem with the audio. Okay, I'll try and speak clearly. So Nina found in her research that some stranded or even successful migrants, mostly men, but also women, take part in the smuggling business. Do you have any indications that this is the case in your case? And if so, would this alter your conclusion? And mine was about speaking a little bit to issues of land, land access and control um, in, in your case specifically. Um, in, uh, in terms of uh, Nina's question, um, I'm not, I haven't come across any example of uh, uh, previous migrants who were stranded and then became smugglers themselves. And I wouldn't be surprised if, because it is a very lucrative uh, um, business. Um, all you need to do is make sure you don't, you don't get caught uh, because the charge, the, what they charge is very high and they have no responsibility. Um, and um, uh, if if there is failure, it is not then they don't take responsibility. Um, if it's if it's successful, they 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 take the credit. They work they work underground, uh, and that's why one of the reasons why there's not been many state prosecutions of the people smugglers is because of this. Um, um, some of them, in fact, even have, uh, uh, we've been informed by, by the district officials uh, in our visit there, that some of them actually have a dual role. They're formally legally established as agents, they're called agents, that the government relies on to connect with, uh, with uh, employers in the receiving countries. Um, and they operate over, over, uh, over, you know, openly as agents. Also, they have a dual another role in which they are secretly people smugglers. Uh, so it's, uh, it's 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 that kind of uh, it's that kind of world. In terms of your question, uh, Lily, it, it was it was about land. Uh, was it was it were you asking me about land issues? Yes. Um, well, in our district as a whole, land is a very scarce commodity. Uh, land ownership is uh, uh, average ownership is very very low. Uh, survey indicates, for instance, that there were 0.6. Um, uh, hectare is the average size of, of uh, land owned by families. Um, this land is also exposed to uh, climatic uh, uh, factors like, like drought or uh, floods. In fact, floods have become more common now than before. Uh, and so the chances of living off the average land uh, for a family is very, 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 uh, very, uh, very, very, very small. And um, so this is why, according to the records that we got from the district office, a majority of the people in our district 
are dependent on what is known as the productive safety net program, a safety net program, which uh, provides them with income for six months of the year. Uh, they're expected to be, you know, uh, not be able to feed themselves for the whole year. And therefore that supplement is supposed to be uh, see them through the year uh, without becoming totally destitute. Thank you, Desaline. Uh, Marion, would you like to speak to some of this? Um, I mean, to be honest, I won't uh, feel so legitimate uh, to, yeah, to, to really mention some aspect of the land. We also uh, witness this in, uh, in Kersa. The, so as I mentioned, we have, we have some, some information about uh, yeah, the land ownership and land fragmentation. Um, yeah, but except what, what has been said, I think I, I don't have anything to add to it. Uh, yeah, thanks for asking. Yeah, Zerahun, would you like to come in? Uh, thank you, Lily. Um, that's a nice question uh, on, uh, in terms of uh, this gendered aspect. And she asked uh, why some uh, do and why uh, others do not. Uh, that's really very interesting. That will take us to the individual decision making and their personal capabilities, including the household uh, capabilities. But one thing is, uh, uh, we need to understand it, the position of uh, girls and women in the two culture uh, is very important. I mean, how girls and women are perceived, seen and in, in RC and Sidama are uh, the two different uh, things. In RC, girls and women have relatively lower position, social position than that of uh, the, the Sidama, and they have limited capacity to make decision uh, for themselves. That's why, uh, unlike in some other regions like uh, in Walaita, Mbata, Jimma, or Wallo areas, where we see uh, girls uh, making uh, domestic migration, um, domestic migration is uh, rare in RC areas. So uh, those who are trying to look for job in Awasa are those living near to the border area. So they can commute to the park and in the evening they can come. But in terms of, well, that's evident. I mean, control of the family is evident in the different cultural settings, including the high pride, uh, pride wells that the artists are asking for their girls. So this, this is a, a very uh, important uh, area to investigate. So their decision making to join the labor force is not exclusively dependent on themselves. It's also a decision made by their uh, family, including uh, the extended families, brothers, cousins, and others. Uh, like for example, if one gets married, he has to pay pride wells to the family and brother, a junior, junior, junior brother think that he, doesn't get sufficient pride wells, he has all cultural rights to uh, stop that marriage. So the power of the others on the woman is so strong, unlike the Sidama culture. Uh, so that's why we don't see many women from RC dominated areas. Those who are going there in walking and other forms to the Awasa and other areas in Rift Valleys are predominantly uh, male. Thank you very much. Did you have anything on the land issue? I was just curious. I mean, it comes up a bit in your paper. I say it again. On land, I had just had a question because I, I, I found, found that land access or control or fragmentation, it was just coming out in different ways in the different papers. So I was a bit curious. Um, the, the issue of land, again, uh, among the Sidama, uh, the Salani, the authority on land, but uh, as you know, all women uh, and men are entitled to have rural land. And uh, now with all this certification and others women are entitled to have equal rights. But in practice, it's not, it's not the same. Uh, like in, in some cultures, people, parents uh, give uh, uh, lands uh, to their 
children, irrespective of their gender, their sex. But in RC areas, they don't give inheritance to girls in, in many cases, because they think that the land belongs to the clan, not the, to the individual, theoretically, even if the individual. So giving to the land, get the land to the girl means giving away that land to a different clan to take her. That's why usually in marriage, while people are giving uh, land and other things uh, to the boy, they provide movable assets and cattle to the girls. So migration due to land scarcity is indirectly affecting the girls rather than directly. It is the boys who are directly affected by the scarcity of land and forced to um, migrate to other areas in different forms. Yeah, thanks. I think it's also really interesting what you bring up in these different kinds of um, governance of land in, the, in different communities. Um, if anyone else has a question, please go ahead. I also have another question myself, but I will wait a moment. Well, we have some a little more time, so write, write it in the chat if you have more questions. Um, so we brought up the Productive Safety Net Program, Real Safety Net Program. And I was actually very curious about this because um, I was wondering if it came up in, in any of the other research from the other papers. Um, and I also saw a paper on it recently that was um, talking about uh, how it actually could um, undermine households that have a work requirement in, with the program from seeking other livelihood um, kind of opportunities in that time. And so, you know, but this speaks to the wider question, I think, that's also coming out in the papers of actually very much uh, a lack of livelihood. This is also something that, uh, you know, one of the few things that I noted in the presentation yesterday was that there was 90% of people in one of our areas that we looked at. Um, and I think that was in Sheshimane, actually, and now I can't quite remember, but it was 90% that thought that, um, you know, lack of livelihood opportunities was a serious or very serious problem. And so what I'm curious about here is also, I mean, if we're going to kind of draw it all together here towards the end, um, you know, I think with the industrial park, it illustrates very clearly this really instrumental role of, of government authorities, um, but also just, you know, what is the role in this, you know, changing, um, uh, environmental conditions, changing demographic pressures, all of these transformations, and this kind of question about, you know, where are these opportunities perhaps going to come from? Are there any expectations of political authorities of government? And, and how are those? So if I could maybe throw those out, throw that question out to all of you. Um, and maybe, Zerhun, if you'd like to take this one up first, and then we'll go back through the other way. Uh, yeah, sure, sure. <laughs> Yeah, industrial parks, as I said, uh, industrial parks, when they are established, uh, one of the major objective industrial parks are supposed to achieve is creating job opportunities. Job program is one of serious problems in this country. Large number of people are risking their lives just in, uh, to get uh, the, you know, job opportunities. People are just flooding to the capital cities uh, like Addis Ababa, Awasa, um, Adama, if you go there, large number of people are coming. In, in Addis Ababa, you can find, you know, young people who can't speak uh, Amharic, just speaking local local language, are forced uh, by lack of opportunity in this uh, in their area. So, in general, industrial parks are supposed to achieve this at national level. Industrial parks are meant to be a national, a federal project, creating job opportunities for everybody around the the, the, the parks like the Awasa Industrial Park, 60,000 people, uh, I said 600,000, not 600,000, 60,000 people around the industrial park is just in 100 kilometer radius. But what we are seeing right now is people who want to get job just living in Tukuruha on the border area, three kilometers from the park are not allowed to take that in, in formal ways. While those living in very far area, something like 275 kilometers, come from all the way there. The industrial parks is willing to do that. The uh, employers association is willing. Uh, the people, the administration, all of them wants to take this opportunity and take workers from Shashamande to the industrial parks. But those who are managing the recruitment system were reluctant because 
informally we were told that these people needs to go to the industry parks in their own region. In this case, that industry park is located 210 kilometers far from their own areas. Even the Shashimane city administration was willing uh, to assign a service that will take these employees to and for to the industry parks. Here, there is one interesting question. Why the city administration is so pushing this question from Oromia region? There is a quota assigned to all administration units to create job opportunities for the youth unemployed, as if that will be solved with setting targets. So they are under severe pressure from authorities to achieve that target. So when they are looking around for those opportunities, here is an industry park, just 20 kilometers. They were pushing. The industry park is willing to take them because according to some researchers, 60% of the employees live within three months period of time. That's high rate of, one of the factor is the living cost in Awasa. So they can't afford, to, so they will go back to their village. If they take workers from Shashamande, at least they don't have any expense for house rent. It will be a win-win for all of them. But the political decision makers at the uh, medium and lower levels were elected. So a project designed at federal level to solve national problems crumbled at the local level, uh, even twisted with the local politics and ended up, that's what I am said. Now the Awas Industry Park is in Sidama region. And there is also a new plan to establish a new industrial park in the former textile uh, uh, industry in Awasa. What will be the local attitude towards job opportunities created in these two areas? You can see the job opportunities in local area for local people uh, with the approach. The leaflets they are preparing for the newcomers are prepared in two languages. That's in Sidama language and in Amharic. So they are trying to be pragmatic because about 80% of the workers coming from Sidama area. So it's a, it's a very interesting, and uh, one needs to look at the governance system at regional level, at Wereda level, and at lower level to understand the situation. Thank you, Lily. Okay, sorry, teacher. I'm on multiple screens and my mouse keeps getting stuck. On <laughs> You'd think I would know by now. Okay, I definitely, that was really fascinating. And I mean, I think so often this question of, you know, what happens in the process of implementation. I mean, I just, I, I find that really fascinating. Um, so that, that was really extremely interesting. Um, Marion or, or Desaline, would either of you like to come in uh, and speak to any of this? Well, um, uh, in terms of uh, governance, if by governance we mean the provision of services uh, for for the community, for for the people who live there in the community, there is of course a immense deficiency uh, in in this. Um, health services, uh, for the young especially, uh, the lack of employment in the community, in the district, uh, stands out as a major, major problem facing them. Uh, and the not just, just the lack of employment, but also in their mind, the inability of the local authorities to actually do their best to try to solve this problem. Um, um, so uh, there is practically some attempt has been uh, made to, uh, to help unemployed youngsters um, to, to get some kind of employment, but this is, the process is very bureaucratic to begin with, um, <clears throat> you need to go through many processes before your, your case is even considered. 
Um, so that's one major uh, issue. Um, and the education system itself, uh, while it's, it has expanded quite considerably in the last 10, 15 years, um, is not, um, does not really inspire young people. Um, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a very low quality education, uh, you know, classes are over full, uh, teachers are not really as, as, as competent as uh, and in interesting, inspiring. Um, so there's a lot of uh, um, draw, I mean, um, deficiencies in the, in the school system. Um, uh, so that's that's also that's also a factor. We must also remember that one of the reasons why this narrative I, I discussed we has become prominent is uh, is 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 new technology nowadays. You know, uh, in, in 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 contrast to say thirty years ago or or twenty five years ago, um, new technology. You know, mobile phones, t television, um, social media, uh, and so forth, have brought new things, new realities that didn't exist before. And youngsters are more savvy now, <clears throat> more aware, not just of their surroundings, but the the the, the, the larger world, the broader uh, society, uh, more so than before. And so that's a factor that's uh, responsible for for their new sort of consciousness that they have at the moment. Um, the safety net program is a major program. It's, it's, a, it's in a way a, a, a success story. Of course, it's very, very costly. Uh, the government covers something like a third of the cost of the safety net program on the on a, on a national level. A third to forty percent, I think, and the rest is covered by by the donor community. Uh, it does provide uh, some form of income to families. I mean, without the, the 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 safety net programs, many families would be very very uh, in difficult situation. Um, it does require uh, families to contribute labor. Uh, sometimes it has had its uh, major uh, drawbacks in that families, in order to comply with their labor requirements, tend to send their children uh, to to make up for for their absence, and so therefore this has some studies have, have shown that this has uh, had a, an impact on children attending school on children be focusing on their education. Uh, instead, they, 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 they're made to work uh, really uh, to, to carry out labor that they shouldn't. Um, and uh, it is surprising that uh, the authorities accept uh, the children to work with adults. I mean, I mean there is theoretically uh, uh, an understanding that, that children below a certain age should not be uh, in, in the workplace. Uh, but that happens and that has been uh, investigated uh, by, by some uh, and, and it's, it's, it's shown to be a major problem. Uh, otherwise, um, it, is a, it is a source of income. It is a source of uh, um, a kind of insurance that provides families with some uh, something to fall back on, especially when things become difficult and hard. <clears throat> Thanks, Desaline. Yeah, it was really helpful to get that also in terms of what we're talking about with the challenges in terms of livelihoods and um, especially kind of rural livelihoods. Um, Marion, I think you haven't had the chance to speak to this, but I want to go through and you can speak to this or maybe sum up if you have any last points. And we'll just, everyone can have a minute or two here at the end uh, before we wrap up. Okay, so probably just take a, a minute now to, yeah, I just wanted to add, uh, really find the, the, the case study of uh, 
of some element very fascinating and and that also really resonates with some aspect of uh, of what we have uh, been working on and this uh, and perhaps the importance of these micro realities because if you look at uh, yeah uh, this for, for for us for example when we uh, thought okay our cable is for example they are in a way uh, less than 40 kilometers from each other and we uh, we're a little bit skeptical to find any um, very important uh, like spatial variation in some uh, some of uh, so either in socioeconomic uh, so to, to really uh, see a socioeconomic heterogeneity or some of the uh, in terms of resources and uh, on the contrary uh, micro reality because we uh, look at so having access or not to uh, a certain resources would make uh, everything completely different. And then the thing is, it seems, of course, that what I found this, uh, the, the case has, that has been presented fascinating is like being close by. So the geographical aspect, uh, it means nothing if there are other invisible barriers uh, that has to be unraveled by, uh, by here, the, 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 the researchers. And um, yeah, so in, in our case, the same, uh, if we look at the reality of a city like Harar, uh, it is so, com it's really completely different compared to what we have observed in, in, uh, in Kesa. And um, yeah, this, um, and then I think here, there is a really, uh, that would be perhaps uh, the, the conclusion, uh, so uh, the final word from my side that um, a couple of years ago, two years ago with some colleagues, we uh, published a review paper on the nexus between climate change and environmental, uh, um, environmental change and migration in Africa. And so looking at the, all the empirical evidence and so trying to make sense of, uh, of them. And one of the aspects is um, if we really uh, say it in a simple way, manner, there's a little bit two strands in the literature. So one on that you have really generalized macro level analysis, for example, of migration drivers or, or impact. And on the other hand, you have a very in-depth ethnographic study research. And this measure level perhaps um, would be a little bit missing. And as we just discussed this, um, looking at, uh, of course, the macro realities of individual of households, uh, but also uh, through the lens of, um, yeah, of this, this local governance and so on. And here I, I really see a huge potential from all the research that has been uh, discussed in the, in the panel to, to contribute to, uh, to, to this. Thank you, Marion, and that was a very positive note. <laughs> but uh, but we have had a lot of uh, contributions that really speak to that in, in a variety of ways. Um, Desaline, do you have any last comments? You're muted. Uh, yes, uh, just one point, uh, which I didn't stress in my presentation. Uh, my focus was on international migration and not on local migration. Now, the two, they're different, not just because of the geographical thing about it, but uh, because of the long tradition. Local migration has a, a long tradition. In fact, we can even say, I don't know if Joseph and Francis will uh, agree with me, Africa as a whole is a, is, is a continent of migration. Way before we, the, you know, the cli climate change uh, appeared on the scene, People were moving, you know, from one place to another. The history of Africa is really the history of mobility. You know, I'm going back to 200, 300, 500 years before. So local migration has that long uh, history, and it is different uh, from international migration. Because international migration, I don't remember us talking about international migration, say, 40 or, or so years ago. The international migration became a, a, an issue uh, in the last uh, three decades or so. Um, but but so that's a point really I, I, I should have stressed, but I didn't. Thank you. Thank you very much, Desaline. And Zerhun, any last points from you? Thank you, Lily. Uh, yeah, it is really very interesting. Um, I think one thing I learned from this uh, workshop in general and uh, uh, while uh, trying to collect data for this uh, particular paper is that 
uh, we can't take one issue uh, and just try to analyze. It's highly complicated and complex and interwoven with uh, uh, different issues at uh, the macro level and medium level and the grassroots level. Uh, in fact, <clears throat> the domestic migration we are just talking about now was not, as the Sarin said, taken seriously, both by local people and uh, by the authorities and even by the researchers uh, before. Now, after like three, four decades, the Wolaitas were coming to the Rift Valley areas and they were providing the necessary labor, both in the industrial areas, in the casual labor, in agriculture. And all of a sudden, what happened between the Oromo and the Wolaita is part of that competition for the labor market uh, in, in Oromia region. So it is the policies taken at the higher level, like the political decisions, the creation of or the formation of regional states on ethnic uh, linguistic boundaries, and the type of political structures we are adopting are affecting individuals' decisions on their migration. Uh, whether to migrate uh, domestic or international. Now, domestic migration is becoming less and less uh, uh, attractive for some people because of the uncertainty it's, it's attached and many people are risking their life for international migration. So it generally uh, shed light on these issues and probably uh, will push on this inshallah and try to understand more and more migration dynamics in this country. Thank you. Thank you so much, Serhun. And thank you so much to all of you, to all of our speakers, uh, to Joseph for being our discussant today and for everyone who participated and asked excellent questions. Um, it's been extremely instructive and wonderful to see so many kind of ways that the different papers have spoken to each other. So we wrote before about the possibility of a special issue and that would, we would be very interested in taking that forward. So we'll be working on that um, and we will be in touch about that in the coming weeks. In the meantime, thank you so much again. It's really been a wonderful experience. And as a thank you to all of you who've contributed in so many ways. Have a wonderful day.